Hey there, everybody. My name is Megan Hopwood, and this is a presentation from the Lone Star College North Harris Library on the secret life of pixels. This is a workshop that we usually put on in our makerspace, but since we are practicing social distancing and the makerspace and library are currently closed, we're going to have this workshop online. So again, my name is Megan Hopwood, and I'm one of the librarians with Lone Star College North Harris. Uh, this presentation was built uh, with two of my wonderful colleagues, Billy Hoya and Katie McGettigan. Uh, they are not here with me today, uh, but we are all librarians. We are all pixel enthusiasts and uh, art creators. Uh, we all enjoy different types of 8-bit uh, art and definitely the games and nostalgia that goes along with those. So. Uh, I was a Sega Genesis kid, um, and Sonic the Hedgehog was probably my first uh, video game experience. Um, but I mean, I've gotta gotta say I love love some good uh, Mario as well. Um, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about like the history of the pixel, not just as a, a digital format, but also as the idea of like individual points of color coming together to create an image. And that's actually where we're going to start when we talk about pixel art. So uh, out of the Impressionist movement came this idea of pointillism, which was using individual dots of color to create a larger image. And this is a uh, famous painting from Georges Seurat. Uh, and we have a few more examples of pointillism. This is a Paul Signac portrait. Uh, another uh, George Surratt, and finally a Henry Matisse. And so all of these images use uh, individual dots of color that if you were to look at them up close, they don't have a lot of meaning. But when you step back, as with most pieces uh, of Impressionist art, form a larger and more beautiful image. Um, there's another type of pointillism uh, called stippling, which uses density of dots to create a image. It's almost always done in black and white. Uh, this is a Pablo Ruiz uh, art. And if you look very closely at it, you can see that all of the shading and all of the dark and light spots of this image come from individual dots of color. Uh, and here's another one by Rob Christensen. So if you look very closely at this uh, wonderful dog, you can see all of the different shading of his, his fur and even the grass he's standing in and everything about this environment is done in tiny dots of color. So this is how we kind of talk about the like art of the, the pixel. But let's move into kind of the history of what we think about as pixel art uh, from the 8-bit side. So Back in ye olden times of early technology, we had systems like the Atari and the original Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Apple II. And all of these systems worked in a pretty similar way in that they couldn't process tons of colors because it takes up so much memory. We were working with a really limited amount of memory. We had to have enough space for not just the art and the colors, but also all of the code that runs the programs. So how did we work around this? Well, one way we did that was uh, separating each 8x8 square of an image into a 8x8 uh, grid. So um, if you were to imagine even this image of a parrot and separate it out into kind of an 8x8 grid, uh, we used binary code to turn parts of that image on and parts of it off. So each uh, bit is represented by either like a one or a zero in either an on or an off. And sometimes those ons and off can be represented by color on the screen. So if it's on, it might show a white square. And if it's off, it would show a black square. So each eight by eight section would only show a maximum of two colors. So, and I have a really great video that I will link down in the doobly-doo of uh, the 8-bit guy who talks about this in a lot more detail. Um, so definitely go check that out and I will uh, link to it. 
So but let's talk about how our, now we've talked about the kind of the code side, but how does it physically load? So if anybody has seen like the old CRT TVs uh, or even computer screens, they load pixels one at a time. They start from the top of the screen and load to the bottom, moving from left to right. And here's kind of a slowed down uh, image of that loading and how that looks. So this is actually really fun because this is how Duck Hunt works, if anybody's played uh, that classic game. So the laser that was pointed out of the gun would actually interrupt that pixel loading process. And if it was detected that that process was interrupted, it would know that you shot the duck. That's how it knew that you got the right spot. Um, and each of these pixels as they load are made up of three different colors and it's made with light and those colors are red, green, and blue. So let's take a closer look at what that looks like. So when you zoom all the way in on a modern screen, uh, you will see these little patches of light and you'll see that it comes in a red, uh, repeating pattern of red, green, blue, red, green, blue. Each section of red, green, blue is a single pixel. And the way that we adjust color and how we see that color uh, comes from how bright and how intense those lights are. So let's take a look at how that loads in a screen. And this is also from the slow-mo guys, um, but you can see as the pixels load and as the screen changes color, the uh, shades and the amount of light emitted by each pixel changes. So we've gone through uh, different intensities of blue and green and red and if it were to go completely dark that would show black and if all of the lights were to come on at their uh, highest intensity that would be what we see as white. So I'll link to this full video so that you can uh, see how it works and how they've uh, zoomed it in on this 4k TV but it's really interesting to see how all of that works. So. Let's go ahead and talk about other ways that we think about uh, pixel art and how that's changed over time. So we are no longer uh, as limited by that eight by eight square of just two colors. Uh, now, because we can uh, have so much more memory and we can create much larger and more detailed images, uh, we can make much more detailed pixel art. So it's kind of a, um, it's definitely, it's an art form. This is uh, the Kraken versus Vikings on a, that came from a site that's dedicated to uh, pixel art called Pixel Joint. And this is another one from that same site of a waterfall. So this one has that, uh, that motion and it's incredibly beautiful and it's all done. If you look at it very closely, you can see where those like individual pixels uh, change color, but it's also uh, experienced a revival in video game and in games that want to evoke that kind of nostalgia of uh, those classic games. So stuff like Stardew Valley is done completely in pixel art, um, and it's honestly one of my favorite games, so I definitely wanted to uh, feature it here. But also games like Undertale uh, evoke that uh, nostalgic uh, pixel feeling without being limited by that eight by eight square of either one color or another. So we also use pixel art or just the idea of having individual squares of color make up a larger image uh, in a lot of different crafts. So if you guys have ever done any kind of cross stitch or embroidery, this is done here. So we have uh, a lot of modern uh, cross stitch and embroidery. It's not your your grandma's embroidery anymore. Uh, we have our surprised Pikachu face. Uh, this comes from the Museum of Design. Uh, it's a image of Frida Kahlo. Uh, if you need a little bit of motivation, just not today. Uh, we can also do this in our crafting of crochet and knitting. Katie and I are both uh, avid crocheters, and uh, next time you see us, ask us about our crochet projects. We're always happy to share what we're working on. So this is a crochet project. I'll link to the article about this particular project. Uh, I believe this Mario 1-1 world took him about six years to complete. 
uh, and it's all done in single crochet. Uh, it's an incredibly beautiful piece of work. So this is a style called corner to corner crochet, where uh, each box is made up of three to four double crochets and you actually work the entire thing uh, on the diagonal. So you start in one corner and you end up in the opposite corner. Knitting is another great way to uh, bring out those individual colors and you just change color as you need a new uh, color representation. What would a presentation from a librarian be without featuring at least a few cats, right? And this is a, a cupcake pixel blanket. So each square is crocheted and then it's all uh, hand sewn together to create a larger image. So and you know if you've seen this workshop in person that we like to play with uh, fusion beads or you might know them by the brand name, Perler Beads. Uh, Perler Beads is the brand name for, uh, for these beads, kind of like Kleenex or Xerox. Um, but fusion beads is the, the general name for them, so that's what we're going to call them here. Uh, this is an amazing piece of work of uh, cosplay done entirely in fusion beads. There's also uh, this huge perler bead project or fusion bead project by uh, Pixel Pope of Bowser. He has a YouTube video of him actually creating this project and I'll definitely link to that so you guys can check it out. And then you can also make three-dimensional art using these uh, one-dimensional systems. So we have a base of fusion beads, there's a background of fusion beads, and then set up in front of that are fusion beads. Uh, shout out to Link to the Past, uh, Link being chased by a chicken. So I hope you enjoyed seeing some of these inspirational pieces of uh, pixel art. So usually when we do this in person, we play with our fusion beads, but since we can't do that, let's go ahead and try making some digital art and I'll show you guys how to do that here. Okay guys, so this is make8bitart.com. I've used this one before to make some 8-bit art for the library, so let's see if I can do anything creative today. So over under instruments, I'm going to make sure I have the pencil selected and I am going to pick a color over here on the side with the color picker. So I think today I'm going to try and draw a cat. And now that I've told you that it's going to be a cat, you're going to have like expectations of it actually looking like a cat. So I guess I better do a good job. <laughs> I feel like a really bad Bob Ross right now. So uh, I'm just going to pick each individual square kind of as I go, and I want it to be kind of parallel on this side. Let's have a symmetrical cat, and, and I'm going to have to pick that invisible color to erase that one. And then since I don't remember what uh, orange I picked, I'm going to use this color picker tool to pick up this orange again. And let's see. Oh, no, I made another mistake. That's okay, though, right? You forgive me? I appreciate that. Okay. So we have a semi-symmetrical kind of outline going. So I'm going to go down, like, over here. And then we'll start kind of, like, curving this face in and I want it to kind of line up down here. So we'll go up, over, over. Cool. Okay. So I'm actually going to try and use this pour feature to see if I can just like pour Orange in there, awesome, okay, cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab like, you know, I feel like a really like light pink to kind of accent 
our little ears up here. And then let's go ahead and do our eyes and get those filled in. So when you get started, it's all kind of about estimating. And even if you don't have it perfect, it's okay. Now I really feel like a weird Bob Ross. Okay, and then my orange kitty had kind of cool, like, bluey-green eyes. So I'm going to fill that in right here. Cool. He looks like he's wearing, like, super extreme mascara, which is fun. Maybe I'll try changing that to like a really, like kind of a darky orange instead of a black around his eyes. Just so that he doesn't look quite so, uh, I guess cat goth. Okay, I like that better. So, he definitely had kind of a pinky nose. I'm going to try and line that up. Uh, in the center here. Cool. And then let's do the mouth. I'm going to do that in the same kind of dark orange. I'm going to use that color picker again to uh, find it. Oops. Let's use that undo button over here on the instruments table. Okay, and then I want that dark orange. And one, two, over. All right, so let's give him some, like, accent colors. So we definitely have some, like, some, like, streakies. And this goofy little chin here. So the thing about doing this kind of art is it definitely requires a lot of patience. Um, there we go. That is, uh, <laughs> well, I guess it's a cat for, for some people. Uh, I'm going to call it a cat for sure. Um, so this is uh, make8bitart.com, and this is my cat. So if I want to uh, save this, I can go to this Make 8-Bit Art box up here, and I'm going to go to Import Save, and I'm going to move it over here just a little bit. And I'm going to uh, make a selection, because I definitely don't want to save. Oops. Nope, not yet. Let's try it again. Selection. I'm not using a mouse right now, so it's kind of hard to select. There we go. That's beautiful oh my goodness uh so we'll right click and we will just save this image uh as as yeah we're just gonna call it cat art perfect i love it so much okay well i hope that you guys enjoyed uh making this 8-bit art with me and i hope you make your own 8-bit art if you do make your own 8-bit art please uh share it with the lone star twitter share it with instagram uh use the hashtag uh lsc makes and uh definitely tag us in it we'd love to see the kinds of stuff that you're making and if you have any questions or are, there's anything that you want to uh, see from us, definitely reach out. We are, are here to help you guys. Um, and I will see you all another time. Thanks.